Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to kind of start this meeting in a Haitian manner. Um, let's see who gets it. But if I say on air, try that again. On air? Okay, that's honor and respect. This is the kind of traditional way that Haitians greet each other. Um, and I think we'll have a very honorable and respectful meeting today with our speakers here. We have a, a full panel, and I appreciate everyone's efforts for getting here under less than desirable weather conditions. Um, I would ask that you please take a moment now, if you have not already done so, to silence your cell phones while I um, briefly introduce this meeting. Um, the title of the meeting is, What's in Haiti's Future? Um, I had ordered a big crystal ball to sit here on the table so we could peer into it, but it hasn't arrived on time. But I'm reminded a little bit by um, something that the uh, late uh, cultural activist and, and voodoo um, Ongan, Pierre André, once told Jonathan Demme, when Jonathan Demme asked him, how big is Haiti? And André said, um, well, it kind of depends. He said, Haiti is like an accordion. Sometimes it's big and sometimes it's small. <laughs> And um, when we were planning this meeting, we expected the accordion to be about halfway open. But it turns out now that uh, Haiti's accordion is pretty, as wide open as the bellows will go at this point. Um, we had envisaged a meeting that would um, take place when it was clear. Uh, we started planning this a couple months ago. We thought it would be fairly clear um, who the next president of Haiti would be. And we thought it would be fairly clear what the objectives would be in moving forward. So we wanted to look into the future. Um, but Haiti, as usual, has confounded and continued to challenge us. It's confronting, at this point, multiple complex and overlapping issues. I'm reminded of my high school algebra and the Venn diagram, you know, where the circles overlap. There's so much overlapping here, it's sometimes hard to keep it straight. But just in summary, I think four major issues would be the the ongoing recovery from the earthquake, the rebuilding, the refoundation, or also known as the build back better. And of course, we've seen some issues there in slow disbursement, slow progress. The interim Haitian Reconstruction Committee still kind of in first gear, slow decision making, um, and an erosion of that initial flush of solidarity within Haiti that we thought would propel things further and faster and three-quarter million people still living in tents. So the pace and scale of the earthquake recovery has been somewhat slow. The second issue, I think, uh, is obviously the political and electoral situation with disputed elections, unclear results. Um, and again, this threatens very much the pace and scale of the earthquake recovery. Um, and with President Proval's term coming rapidly uh, to an end, this is an issue that has eclipsed all others at this point, um, and it needs to be resolved somehow. The third circle in that diagram, I think, is the uh, cholera epidemic. And I think it's worth underscoring that that epidemic is not at all related directly to the earthquake. It is rather a condition of Haiti's vulnerabilities through poverty, lack of sanitation, weak public health system, and weak infrastructure <coughs> that this virus or disease was able to spread so quickly. The good news there seems to be that the pace of the uh, extension of the epidemic has begun to slow. And then the fourth circle came kind of suddenly and, and out of the clear blue sky, which was the return of the dictator, um, Jean-Claude Duvalier, after 25 years in exile, suddenly appears on the scene. and. Uh, creates more chaos and confusion. And then, of course, in the minds of many, there's a potential fifth circle to join this Venn diagram, and that is of another exiled Haitian leader, uh, Jean-Bertrand Aristide. So we have all this going on at once. Um, and to help us sort this out a little bit, um, this morass of complexity, and suggest perhaps um, what might be in Haiti's future, we have four excellent speakers. You have their bios in front of you. I assume you picked them up off the table there. 
So I will not go into any depth. I will just introduce them by their current titles in the order in which they will speak. We will first hear from Ambassador Thomas Adams, who is the special, the Haiti Special Coordinator at the U.S. Department of State. Following him will be Mr. Alexandre Abrantes, the Special Envoy for Haiti from the World Bank. Then will we hear from uh, Mark Schneider, the Senior Vice President of the International Crisis Group. And our final speaker will be Dr. Robert Faton, Associate Dean for Graduate Programs at University of Haiti and himself a Haitian American. So without any further comments from me, Virginia. I present you Ambassador Adams. Thank you, Bob. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for slugging through the slush to get here. Um, I hope we make it worth your while. Uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, the U.S. plan for Haiti's recovery, um, and I also thought I, I might talk uh, a bit about the political process after that, but briefly, because I find the most interesting parts <coughs> of, of these sessions are your questions and answers. Um, I always start with this because uh, I think it's, uh, it's good for people to know that uh, the United States pledge there, the sort of third one from the left of 1.152 million of new money for Haiti, um, is a relatively small part of the total of nearly 10 billion that has, has been pledged for Haiti. Um, and I, I usually say this so that uh, my good friends uh, around the Beltway who are looking for funding realize that uh, not all of it is available from us uh, here. Uh, I think uh, if you look at the, uh, at the one on the right there, the, uh, the amount of money unallocated has dropped a bit, but it's still pretty high. And that's a good thing in a way because uh, as we move forward, we find that, uh, that priorities have changed a bit. The cholera epidemic uh, has, has reinforced the need to move ahead faster on sanitation, water and sanitation projects, uh, and, and other things. So um, th that's in somewhat a good way, but we would like to see that money committed also for, for longstanding uh, problems there, like rubble removal and, and tea shelters. Um, Bob, Bob is right that the pace of reconstruction has been slower than we expected. Uh, nobody met their targets for, for tea shelters or rubble removals. Um, and, and I think uh, the problem there is, is basically, as I talk to NGOs who are trying to get this done in the field, that uh, many of them worked all over the world, and they say, Haiti's the toughest place in the world I've ever been to get things done, actually. And I think that's true. The encouraging news is that in the last two months, uh, we've seen uh, these same NGOs kind of hit their pace. The, 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 the number of tea shelters has increased dramatically. The rubble removed has gone up quite a bit. And uh, typically, after these kinds of disasters, uh, the recovery process hits its stride after about 18 months. And I think Haiti will be uh, largely true to that, although there are some obstacles uh, that, uh, that Bob mentioned to, to making greater progress. Um, this, is, this is kind of our strategy framework for U.S. assistance. Uh, we have we have picked out certain areas uh, that we're going to we're going to help out, and under under certain principles, we are working in three economic corridors in the country intensively. Other countries have picked other corridors. I always get asked by Haitians, "None of your corridors are in the South. Do you hate the South?" We don't, but the Canadians and the Spaniards and others are working in the South. So um, there there is there is a, a method to our madness here. Um, here you can see the three development corridors uh, up north, kind of in the middle, and then, uh, and then to the east of Port-au-Prince that the U.S. has staked out for, for intensive development. Um, and here's some more detail uh, what we're going to do. Um, the, the recovery uh, of Haiti from the earthquake was, was probably done about as well, the massive <coughs> massive recovery effort that was undertaken by the United States and other countries. In hindsight, I think most people agree it was, it was probably uh, done about as well as these things generally are. Um, um, moving forward, as you shift gears to development, 
uh, it's a different pace. And I'll just pick out an example here of that. Um, Haiti needs a lot of things, as, as anybody who's been there knows, but the thing they need most is, is, is jobs. Uh, maybe tied with that as a stable government. Um, and how do you get sustainable jobs there? Well, one of the, one of the uh, ways is to, is to uh, take advantage of the HELP Act, uh, the duty-free import uh, uh, privileges that uh, Congress has extended to Haiti. And the best way uh, we, that we think is doing that is to, is to actually build some industrial zones. We have one that was uh, just, uh, we signed the agreements uh, a few a week ago up north in Cap Hacienda. And uh, it will initially provide about 18,000 jobs, mostly in textile, all of their furniture, manufacturing, and others. Um, and it won't just be the t-shirt industry. Uh, there's there's the Haiti uh, the the Bush Clinton fund is doing vocational training uh, so that Haitians can move uh, up the food chain on on uh, clothing manufacturing. Haitians, as you know, are very artistic. Uh, we think they can they can do clothing design and other things. So uh, there's also a, an attempt to 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 really expand that industry into the more lucrative parts. At full blast, these zones can employ directly 65,000 people. There's room there. And the economics of settling there are, are overwhelmingly favorable for most businesses. What, what scares them off right now is the political instability. As uh, former Secretary of the Treasury Robert Rubin once said, capital is a coward. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we have to work on that. There's other possibilities. Agriculture is promising only in this sense is that uh, agriculture is such a low level in Haiti uh, that uh, through some uh, good agricultural extension work and practices, it's not that hard to triple the income of farmers. Um, I don't think you're going to create a lot of jobs in the farming sector where 60 percent of Haitians allegedly work. But um, if, you can, if you can increase their income, you'll, you'll, you'll be going for far peace. Tourism is also has some possibilities, as anybody who's been to the Dominican Republic can see. Uh, but the hard part uh, on creating jobs is going to be to kind of break up the current business practices of Haiti which in many ways are 19th century and archaic and uh, need to be blown up uh, and start over again. If you want to start a new business there, you have to submit your com company charter, handwritten in a nice French pot de plume, for example. So um, uh, that's something that needs to be done. And the IDB and others have, have taken steps to do that. There have already been some, uh, some steps taken to make it easier, but that whole area needs to be uh, improved. Uh, Health, we've taken a big stake in health, um, and that means we haven't taken a, a, a big stake in education. Um, education tends to be uh, a fairly popular sector. A lot of donors are there. The IDB has taken a big stake in that, but um, we, we, are, we are going to do a lot in health, uh, starting at the top at the, uh, with, with the, the flagship university hospital. We're going to rebuild it along with the French and move down to, 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 to clinics at the bottom. Um, uh, governance and the rule of law is, is another area. The, the Haitian Constitution actually currently allows for a decentralized government, but it's never been implemented. Um, they have agreed in, in, in their plan uh, to do so. Uh, that, needs to be, that needs to be done. Um, and here's a few examples of things we have, uh, we have done in, in Haiti. Um, variety of things just picked out but uh, you know 13 we've done about half the tea shelters that were built but still w well short of our goal there um, so I will s I will let sort of the end of my slideshow but uh, let me talk a little bit about the electoral crisis here because uh, that's kind of the topic <coughs> of the day um, I think most of you know uh, the elections on on the 28th of uh, uh, November were widely uh, viewed as fraudulent by many of the of the actors down there, the opposition. Um, it, it, uh, it rattled around for a while. Um, and finally, uh, on December 13th, President Preval agreed to allow a verification team in from the OAS, which was made up of, of really technical people, elections experts, statisticians, and others. It wasn't, wasn't populated by political types. And they, uh, they looked through. Um, uh, they did an audit, a fairly full audit of, of the balloting, and uh, came up with some different numbers, uh, some findings. Um, 
these findings were given to the government, given to the CEP. The CEP is now folding them into its contestation process, which is going on this week. Uh, under Haitian law, candidates can, can <coughs> contest the results. There are a number of contest contestations filed, um, uh, including by uh, Michael Martelli and, and Jude Celestin on the presidential side. There are about 200 contestations filed on the parliamentary side. Uh, these contestations uh, take place in public, the final stage. There are two OAS lawyers on each panel, uh, French-speaking OAS lawyers, and um, we, uh, well, they should finish their work by this Friday and no later than February 2nd announce the, the final results <coughs> of the first round. Um, and there's been a lot of uh, uh, press about uh, whether Jude Celestin might withdraw, might stay in, uh, whether, um, uh, you know, exactly how it will work out, we're unsure, but it, it does provide for drama um, down there. Uh, we, the United States all along has you know, we have not favored any candidates. Uh, we favor a fair process. Uh, the rumor in Port of Prance is that we're, we're pushing uh, Michael Martelli or uh, others. Uh, we're not. Uh, we're just pushing a fair process here. So um, I think I'll stop here and, and let our next speaker go. Uh, and then I guess after we're all done, we get, we get questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the organization to, for having invited us here. Thank you, such a wide audience. It's such a uh, unfriendly morning uh, outside. Uh, I was asked to uh, uh, basically uh, respond to uh, Mr. Uh, Ambassador Adams' uh, speech. And um, let me, um, uh, and also I'll probably take advantage to maybe um, brush the four points that uh, our chair has brought. Uh, on the first point, uh, which is the pace of the recovery, I happen to be one of the uh, more optimistic ones uh, in Porto Prince in terms of the pace of recovery. Uh, could, would I like it to have gone faster? Yes. Could it have gone faster? I'm not sure. What I've done is to compare the recovery of Haiti with the recovery of other countries which have had uh, equivalent or comparable disasters. Honduras, uh, Aceh in Indonesia, even Katrina, uh, the uh, horrendous uh, things in Rwanda. How long did these countries take uh, to rebuild their physical infrastructure and their social cohesion, their institutions? And you will look and you will see that normally it's considered first year. There's no reconstruction in the first year after the event. It's only emergency and relief. So on January 12th, we should not have been asking ourselves, how is the reconstruction going? We should have been asking ourselves, was our relief uh, and emergency operation successful? And uh, there's plenty of evidence to, see, to say that it's quite, quite successful. In Aceh, it took them one year to even create the equivalent of the Interim Commission for the Recovery of Haiti. And Haiti had it up in four months. Uh, after one year, while the Aceh people, which had a government in, in, in Jakarta, far away from the, from, from the problem, had a large budget, uh, one year after, they were still creating a, uh, uh, the commission, while in <coughs> Haiti, after one year, they have approved already $2 billion in, in, uh, in projects, and uh, many of them are already in, under implementation. So uh, I would you know, say also let me another number of figures. It took about two to three years for people to leave the camps in Aceh. Uh, in, uh, in Haiti, um, half of the people have gone back to their homes. A third of the camps have been closed. These are not my numbers, these are the numbers of the IOM. So, you know, something has happened, uh, and uh, we shouldn't be bashing ourselves all the time, uh, given that the circumstances, because Asia didn't have rubble. Asia didn't lose 25% of its civil servants. Uh, so, you know, would I have liked it to have be faster? Yes. Could it have been faster? 
I'm not sure, uh, given the circumstances. And compared to other disasters, uh, I don't think uh, uh, we're doing too badly. Even in terms of the pledges, uh, we hear the press and CNN and so forth saying, oh, the money never flowed. You know, if you go into President Clinton's uh, uh, website, you can actually see how much was pledged, how, was, how much was dispersed, and so forth. The last numbers I saw that uh, five, five of the $5 billion pledged for 210 to 11, 50% of it is on the table. So, not too bad. Uh, of that, $2.7 billion have been approved in projects, and about 40% have been disbursed. So, is 40% good or bad? I mean, in terms of the World Bank, we are disbursing 11, 11 million a month, which is more than we disburse in any other Latin American country. So in spite of the difficulties, of the weakness and so forth, uh, we must be doing something right and adapted to the circumstances and things are going not, you know, like stellar way. But I'm not embarrassed or, or, or uh, with the pace uh, uh, of the recovery in, uh, uh, in Haiti. The second point I wanted to bring you is this was a great disaster. Other countries have gone through great disasters and have grabbed this opportunity to do a leapfrog jump. The most uh, famous example is the countries uh, during World War II who actually were completely destroyed and then suddenly with a Marshall Plan were able to build better roads, uh, new factories as opposed to old factories, new technologies instead of uh, uh, old technology. And therefore, their growth rates and their economy was much better uh, after the war than before the war, actually with some resentment of the countries which were contributing for this reconstruction. So my question to you is that can uh, the same happen in two other situations uh, in, in, Hondo uh, in um, uh, El Salvador after the earthquake? I think they grabbed the opportunity to introduce reforms, to introduce new packages, new ways of doing things, and their growth rates uh, just accelerated to much faster pa pace than they had before. Uh, another example is Rwanda, after the one million people uh, genocide. Uh, it took them a couple of years, six, seven, eight years, but they then went into the virtuous circle of a accelerated growth because the catastrophe shook them up and uh, uh, the government that ensued had the political will, had the reform spirit, and therefore took the opportunity and had the, uh, uh, the, 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 the country you know, move forward. Uh, the bank has just uh, finished a, um, a, uh, uh, an economic uh, study. We did some projections and economic modeling and came up with three scenarios. Uh, and I'll go from the worst to the, to the best scenario. The worst <laughs> scenario is that uh, Haiti uh, misses the opportunity. Basically, it doesn't uh, disburse the funds which are available, uh, is unwilling, uh, is, uh, you know, consumes his time in political crisis, is unwilling to take uh, macroeconomic reforms, or is unwilling to improve the business climate, is unwilling to take <coughs> any agenda, just, you know, <coughs> is, uh, uh, doesn't do its job and that is poor governance. In that scenario, our expectation is there will be a peak of growth now in 2010 to 11, to, uh, to 11 to 12 because of the influx of financial uh, uh, inputs from foreign countries. Uh, but that then will go down to the pre-earthquake uh, uh, rates have two, three percent, uh, uh, two percent, two, three percent growth rates in the economy, and that's what I would call the missed opportunity uh, uh, scenario. The second one is what we call the base case scenario. That is one in which uh, uh, the reconstruction uh, is successful. Uh, we they use uh, the. Uh, the, the, the resources available well, institutions are rebuilt, uh, but there is no real uh, willing and, and that the foreign investment will follow the external investment from different donors, uh, but there is no real uh, willness, uh, will for taking decisions or tough decisions or change dramatically the way in which the country f functions, either in the rule of law, 
in the governance uh, side and in the business environment uh, side. In that case, we expect the economy to grow quite fast this year and next year, maybe 9, 10%, and then it will go down to 6, 7% in the outer years. It's a base case scenario, which is a good scenario. And then is the uh, leapfrog scenario, uh, the high case scenario. That is uh, the scenario in which uh, this election comes up with a creative uh, and uh, courageous government who decides to take over some of the uh, difficult uh, uh, bottlenecks in the system of, of governance in Haiti, takes on the, uh, the uh, uh, business uh, climate agenda, takes on the governance agenda, takes on the, uh, uh, state, uh, the rule of law agenda, and uh, uses um, and disburses all the funds which are available in the reconstruction. And uh, in that scenario, we think the country will grow probably 10 to 11 percent in the next two years, and then we'll get into the 8, 9 percent uh, growth rate uh, in the outer years. So uh, then finally, I want to, before I conclude, where does the bank uh, fit into this? The bank is willing to bet in the leapfrog scenario, uh, and we're putting in uh, $500 million of IDA funds in the next three years. Uh, and uh, <coughs> we are preparing what we call a country assistance strategy, uh, which we were discussing with our partners so that there's no overlap. And uh, our expectation, and we'll discuss with the new government what is in, in town, uh, and we think that about 25% of that money will go to areas where we're very strong, like economic and fiscal policy, governance, business climate, about 25-30% to the social agenda, education and health, uh, more on education and on health, but we'll do a little bit on health, uh, because we've not just engaged in the cholera fight, and we need to um, rebuild in Haiti the public health core, which disappeared when the countries disengaged from Haiti and the NGOs took over, uh, all the capacity of a public health core of a CDC that all disappeared. And I think it's an area probably interesting to rebuild. And finally, the rest more on infrastructure. Housing is our, uh, like, a flagship, uh, basically uh, bringing people back to their old neighborhoods and reviving their neighborhoods. Uh, roads and bridge, not building them, but basically establish a system of maintenance of roads and bridges, which doesn't exist in the country. They are built by EU who loves to pave roads, uh, by the IDB, uh, but then there's no maintenance. And therefore, we might add a little niche uh, uh, business, which would be the business of, of main maintaining. Uh, we'll probably uh, invest in agriculture and a lot in the community-driven development. We believe as ambassador on the decentralization, on uh, strengthening the communities and their, uh, and their capacity, strengthening the municipalities. Uh, finally, we will have to have a contingency, which we call disaster preparedness and response, because as you know, every year there is a surprise uh, in Haiti, and therefore we have to leave a flexibility in our program to be able to respond on the dot to these, uh, uh, to these uh, emergencies. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm ready for your questions. Uh, thank you very, again for USIP for continuing to focus on Haiti over uh, the past year and even before that. Um, and I want to thank my colleagues for having started the process of discussing what is in Haiti's future. Um, actually, I think a great deal depends on what happens in Haiti over the next several days and the next several weeks before you're able to answer that question. Um, I'm more uh, fearful than either of my colleagues uh, at this point. I think Haiti, its people, its leaders, and its existence as an independent sovereign country are rapidly approaching a moment of historical truth. From the dawn on November 28th until the present moment, Haiti has resembled nothing more than a driverless SUV carrying 10 million Haitian citizens, its leaders fighting over the wheel and aimed to crash into a brick wall. The fraud, confusion, and utter despair of voters 
and massive unhappiness of Haitians and its international partners with the way the initial preliminary results were declared added to the speed of the car. In recent weeks, there have been more voices being shouted out what seemed like easy answers. Force the elected president to resign right now and replace him with a transitional government that the traditional elite and their parties would pick to rerun the elections. Forget about elections in the Constitution entirely and allow that government to run the country until recovery has occurred. Or declare Haiti a ward of the United Nations and given the incredible historical weakness of its institutions and its economy and the disaster's further decapitation of much of the Haitian governmental and economic structure, even some friends of Haiti seem sympathetic to that outcome. We believe that the crisis group, and I believe strongly that all of those roads lead nowhere except to greater disruption, instability, and conflict, and for the Haitian people, misery. Haiti needs what's been lacking since the earthquake, which is an end to the politics of partisan self-interest and the adoption by all parties and all political leaders, left and right, pro-Praval and anti-Praval, of a principle of national reconstruction and national unity based on the rule of law and the Constitution. Perhaps, just perhaps, in the last few days, there may be a growing realization that no, not only is Haiti in danger of losing a one-time only five to ten billion dollar contribution from international donors for the future of its children and its grandchildren, but the independence that it fought 200 years ago to win for its citizens. In December, as you heard, the international community convinced President Praval and some Haitian leaders to accept an independent review of the first round presidential voting by the OAS, and its verification panel produced what you might call a GPS for that out of control Haitian SUV. It basically said that the initial results were fraught with abuse and that the actual two candidates for the second round were Merlan Manigat and Michel Sweet Mickey Martelly, the latter with no government experience in his background whatsoever, but clearly, according to the panel, the choice of a sufficient percentage of the, elect of the electorate to reach the second round. President Praval's candidate, Jude Celestin, was found in the review to fall from second to third place. That report was presented to President Praval and by him to the CEP, and only yesterday, if we're reading the newspapers, does it, is there some indication that the recommendation might be accepted? I emphasize might. If it is accepted, then perhaps Haiti will have sidestepped the worst disaster, and potentially, and this gives us greatest, great concern, a far greater degree of bloodshed that's possible if they don't accept that. Let me be clear that there's an ongoing review process you've heard of the disputes by the CEP coming from individual candidates, both presidential and parliamentary, and those have to be resolved and hopefully will be by the end, by the end of this week. And it's also essential that the CEP, and here President Praval suggested in his turning the report over to the CEP, that they take the OAS recommendations and findings as a basis as well for disputes that had to be resolved. OAS lawyers, as you've heard, are assisting the process. Again, it seems to us that all Haitian leaders should speak out to have the conclusion be to permit the holding of a second round in accord with the recommendations of the OAS is the least bad option available to Haiti in the time period required for a new president to be inaugurated before President Praval completes five years in office. However, the OAS panel did more than simply make findings with respect to the outcome of the first round. And there has not been a lot of focus on this. It issued a set of recommendations with respect to how the second round should be run in order to ensure that you don't have the same outcome as you had in the first round. We published a report in October, the end of October, on the elections, on what was coming down the road. There are copies out there. Many of those recommendations are part of the OAS recommendations now. They are still valid. And if they're not put into effect, I'm afraid that the second round could well be a replica of the first. To some degree, that includes, to the degree possible, reform CEP, with the, at the very least, a new president, which would be a key factor in rebuilding public confidence in the next round. 
It would be enhanced, that confidence would be enhanced if all party leaders, including the two runoff candidates, were to agree that whoever wins will reach out to his or her opponent in the runoff and seek professionals from all parties to form the next government of national reconstruction. That also would be the best way to convince donors to fulfill their commitments to help put Haiti's hopes back on the road to recovery, its infrastructure, institutional and physical, rural and urban, to reconstruction and its devastated economy to recuperation. And here, let me just note in, in relation to the, um, the comments from the World Bank, true, I think that Haiti, you can say, in the relief phase did much better and, and that one should not expect it to move faster than Aceh, et cetera. The problem is, is that Haiti, all of your examples, Haiti had began at a far worse stage than any of those examples, even World War II. The educated population in Germany and Japan prior to World War II, Haiti didn't have that. Haiti had 80% of its population living in poverty. It had institutions which were weak. It had a police force which was just beginning to become respected. It had serious questions about security and an economy that was, at the very least, according to um, St. Paul, the most unequal in the hemisphere in terms of Gini coefficient and any other measurement that you want. So it has a far greater distance to travel to achieve recovery. And I, I agree with you that there's still a huge potential, but it begins with having a government with whom the international community can partner and with whom the people of Haiti can be confident. So many of our recommendations for the second round are as the OAS. Issue the remaining ID cards. 400,000 people lost their cards in the earthquake. Perhaps 225,000 received them. Significant numbers still don't have ID cards. The ones who did receive them didn't find their names on the voting lists. That needs to be changed. They need to be posted on the communes so that the voters can verify their vote polling places. Provide the list to political parties for revision. Provide adequate training to poll workers. Remember, poll workers were being trained the night before the elections. I mean, that just simply is a, a sure formula for confusion and disaster. And there needs to be a massively enhanced supervisory structure with international monitoring from day one right through to the signing of the tally sheets and the tabulation of voters. Right now, I would urge the U.S. and the international community to essentially ensure that you've got international monitors at every point at every polling place. There are 1,500 around the country, were 1,500 around the country, 11,000 voting tables. There needs to be monitors, along with Haitian monitors. And you need to enforce the constitutional restrictions on the use of government resources in the electoral campaign and sanction all violators, and halt the public carrying of weapons by individuals during the electoral period. These are some of the things, along with a post-election, hopefully, constitutional reform to deal with some of Haiti's major problems that we believe are necessary. We don't have to go into how did Haiti get here, but most of these recommendations were not put into effect before the first round. I'll end by simply saying that Haiti still needs to forge a political consensus and complete the electoral process. And together with the IHRC and the international community and the opposition political parties and other sectors, they really do need to come together for the good of the country and forge a new path to a new government and to a new future for Haiti. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I must confess that I do not share the optimism of my previous panelists. And I don't share that optimism because I think the political situation is so complicated and so much in flux that I do not see in the immediate future a government that will be perceived by the majority of Haitians as legitimate and ultimately as capable of dealing with the fundamental problems of the country. Now, why do I say that? I mean, I say that because of what has happened with the elections and the post-electoral process. If we look at the elections of late November, they were, as we all know, quite bad. They were badly organized and they were fraudulent. Uh, there was a very low rate of participation. Uh, so that indicates that the vast majority of Haitians 
I think, didn't give a damn, to put it crudely, about the electoral process. There is great disenchantment, not only with the current government, but with all the political class, including those who are, in fact, in the elections. And there is great disappointment. And actually, to put it even more crudely, uh, most Haitians are fed up, not only with the domestic partners, but also with the international partners. And there is no great optimism about the future when you talk to the average Haitian, and actually when you talk also to some of the privileged sector. Now, why can we look at the political situation and say that, in fact, it is indeed not fundamentally different from the one that existed prior to the earthquake? Remember, the day of the election, all the candidates except Jude Célestin, the candidate of the governing uh, regime, decided the elections were so bad that they were going to can they should, the election should be canceled. Twelve hours afterwards, because two of the candidates realized that they may have a shot at the second round, then they decided the elections were not that bad. Then the CEP announced the results, and clearly, Sweet Mickey was not happy with the results, and they probably are incorrect. Well, no one knows, really, uh, in spite of the OS report, what that 20 or 22 percent of the Haitian population voted for. It's impossible to know with accuracy. So, and this is to a large degree acknowledged in the OS report that elections were really very bad, that there were lost votes, and that a significant portion of the electorate who might have voted didn't vote because there was disorder at, at midday. So the elections were really a fiasco. Now, what happens after that, I think, uh, exacerbates the situation because the Constitution is violated left and right by every single participant. Uh, now, when uh, uh, President Preval asked for the OS report, this is something that clearly comes from an extra-constitutional process. Now, the OS gives its results, and what is very surprising is that the difference between the now number two and the now number three is 0.3%. So why would Jude Célestin accept to desist at this particular moment? That is a real enigma. Uh, and why would Michel Martelly, in the first <laughs> instance of the CEP result, desist too? So, and that has not been resolved. We've heard yesterday from certain members of UNITE that uh, uh, Mr. Célestin was going to step down. Well, it doesn't at all seem clear to me that he will step down. Uh, I don't particularly think that he has an interest to step down until the CEP is done with the phase of dispute. Now, there is another element that has intruded even more so in Haitian politics, and that's the role of the international community. And I think the very public and very loud uh, signs that have been put out uh, really undermine the previous policies in some fundamental way. I mean, one has to remember that Wene Breval was the darling of the international community for a very long time. And suddenly now there is clearly a fundamental rift between Wene Breval and the international community. And the question is whether the very public, and I'm talking about French ambassador, American ambassador, uh, Mr. Mullet, saying that the Haitian government has to essentially agree with the OS if that is not going to be counterproductive. In Haiti, as we know, there is such a thing as maronage. And maronage in politics essentially means that you avoid the obstacles by saying yes, and then you say no, and then you say yes, and the process goes on and on and on. And I think we are very much at this juncture. Uh, it is not clear that in spite of the considerable pressures that are put on Preval and Célestin, that this will lead to the desired results. Now, assuming that the international community is no longer prepared to accept the second round, that is not the second round between Michel Martelly and Milan Maniga, there are certain questions that do to be answered. Who is going to be president of Haiti during that time? Is it going to be René Préval or not? Is René Préval going to have a bluff and say on, on February 7th, well, bye-bye. What does the international community do at this point if that is, 
that, that is not an impossibility. So that's a fundamental question. Then assuming that Breval would be president and that we prolong the mandate to May 14th, uh, would the CEP be the same CEP running the second round? That remains unclear. And more importantly, if you have a second round between uh, Sweet Mickey and Mirlan Maniga, do we have any guarantee that in the post-electoral phase, the loser will accept the results? That remains very, very unclear to me. Now, there is also the role of the CEP. Uh, the CEP could again play maronage. That is to say, it could ultimately decide, well, we will look at the OS report, we'll accept part of it, and we will say that there's a statistical tie. In other words, second round with three candidates. It's not clear what the international community would do now. And I'm not sure if the international community is absolutely sure that it wants a second round just with Martelly and Maniga. This is a question that we may have answered le later on today, if in fact Celestin desist, and if in fact the OAS has a very strong resolution pushing the Haitian government further. Now, when we have the second round, the question is whether we are going to get, and irrespective of whether you have two, whether you have three, whether you're going to get a legitimate government, and a government that is strong enough to push for the fundamental reforms that Haiti needs. And that, again, that seems very unclear. I don't think you're going to have a very strong government, because you also have to deal with the parliament. And it's unlikely that you're going to have harmony between the two bodies. The infighting may probably start the very day after the post-electoral process, in terms of who's going to be prime minister, and from which side of the political spectrum that prime minister is going to come from. So again, we have fundamental issues. Now, there could be a coup de théâtre that ultimately uh, people say, well, in some sectors of Haitian society, and Preval himself and the CEP, the elections are bad, we are canceling the elections. Uh, I doubt that at this particular juncture this is going to happen, given the pressure of the international community, but given the twists that we've seen in uh, Haitian politics, nothing is impossible. This is a consideration that has to be taken into account. Now, once you have a government, the government is going to have to deal with the very high expectations of the population. And the population is, as I've said, very tired with the current conditions in Haiti. Uh, the population is so tired with the current conditions that they want fundamental change. But it's not clear when you look at the candidates, whomever you are talking about, that they offer a programmatic alternative. Uh, the uh, Haitian leaders are to some extent, and to put it very bluntly, prisoners of the international community and of the flow of assistance. Uh, the, the planning of uh, the economic development of Haiti is no longer really in the hands uh, of Haitians to a large degree, whether we want to say so politely or not. Uh, Haiti, uh, you know, has all of the disadvantages of a trusteeship without the responsibility of those who are doing the trusteeship. Uh, so this presents real problems uh, for the country. Uh, now, when you look at the second round, uh, clearly Michel Martelly, who ran a very smart campaign presenting himself as the candidate for change, will probably, if he's in the second round, continue to do so. But the intrusion of uh, Jean-Claude Duvalier into the political picture may generate some uh, unexpected consequences because Michel Martelly has very clearly stated that he has no problem with uh, Jean-Claude Duvalier. In fact, he may even ask Jean-Claude Duvalier to be uh, an advisor. What would that do uh, in terms of the electoral consequences? Uh, Madame Maniga, will probably present herself as the person who has the experience, who has the knowledge, and she probably will run as, and many people have heard it already say, so as the mother of the country is going to take care of the country. The question whether is whether she has, in fact, uh, the capacity uh, to reach out to the youth of the country. And this is a big question. And this is where Michel Martelly, I think, has a considerable advantage, that he can reach out in a very weird way to the very same constituency that supported Aristide from the, o the opposite spectrum uh, of politics. Finally, if Celestin, if there is a third round, uh, if Celestin is in, 
uh, that third round. I think that Celestin will have to rebrand himself. And it may well be that what has been happening the last two, two or three days is very much part of that rebranding. In other words, Celestin presenting himself as the candidate of change, no longer prisoner of Inité, opposed to Préval, etc., etc., while getting the support of Préval and Inité. So that could be the beginning of that. So we need to wait maybe another 48 hours to know exactly what's going to happen with Jude Célestin, with the Electoral Council, uh, before uh, we can really assume that there is going to be a second round without, uh, 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 and not only a second round, but who is going to be in the second round. But the politics of the situation is really uh, very much the old politics that we've had. That is to say, uh, what I, I, I have called the politics of the belly. Politics in Haiti is a matter of conquering state office uh, to enrich yourself. That has not fundamentally changed. The political class that we have now is very much a political class that has been in the, running the show for the past 30 or, 50 or 40 years. You don't really have new characters, except maybe if you look at the figure of Martelly, but on the other hand, he's linked to uh, poli uh, political groups that are not that fundamentally different from the old ones. So we are in a state, I think, of paralysis. And I'm afraid, and this is where it is really a very tragic scenario, that uh, the opportunity that was uh, presented in a paradoxical way by the earthquake to fundamentally change Haitian politics, fundamentally address the issues of poverty, fundamentally address the issue of concentrating all the resources of the country in Port-au-Prince have not been dealt with. And this is an oppor opportunity that has ultimately, I think, been wasted. Uh, I'll conclude by hoping that I am absolutely wrong about that prognosis, because if I'm right, the future doesn't look uh, uh, better than the, than the past. Thank you. Well, I thank all of our speakers for their um, comments and attempts to look into the future. We certainly have diverse views. Um, I think what we can do here, we do have a fair amount of time for a Q&A. And, &A. and um, what I'd like to do is we have a, a mic. Yes, we have a roving mic today. So um, <coughs> if you do wish to ask a question, I would ask several things. Um, one is that you identify yourself and your organization. And two, that you keep your question uh, fairly short. And just uh, please ask one question at a time. Um, so. Um, Maybe we'll take the question in questions in pairs um, to start off with. So, Liz, there's uh, one up here and one back there. Uh, good morning. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists for their really instructive and informative uh, observations. Uh, my name is Charlie Martell, and I was working with the United States Senate till Monday, and I start with a legal nonprofit. Uh, tomorrow called the Constitution Project, so I am kind of a, a tweener. Uh, I spent a week in Haiti in October, and a number of the remarks had a great deal of resonance, particularly those of Dr. Fatan and, and Mr. Adams. And, and I want to ask a question about some good things I saw and some troubling things that tie into your um, remarks. Um, we worked with a group of young Haitians, and we saw some of the, a lot of the skepticism about politics that you observed. Uh, of the 20 people we worked with, only one was even thinking about voting. Um, I showed them the identification card for my dog and they laughed. They said, in this country, people don't have these cards. So there was enormous skepticism for a lot of the reasons that you observed uh, and a complete absence of faith that the political system was workable because of the captivity that you noticed. Uh, but a lot of them said, when I asked them what we need, they, they talked about what you said, Mr. <coughs> Adams. They said, we need jobs. And these people were working. They were optimistic about what they could do at the local level. They had enormous love of country and faith. So you had this cynicism about politics, but enormous faith and energy in themselves. So my question is, how do you fuse that? How do you fuse the good things in, in the youth that I worked with? I mean, I remember coming away thinking, if this is the future, if these guys are the future, they got a shot. 
but they're up against so much with the political problems. How do you turn that positive energy uh, and overcome those political problems? How do you, I guess, how do you empower those people? Okay, um, let's right back here. Uh, my name is Marlene Dockfield. Right now I'm working with the Ota International. We're doing some project in Haiti. Um, 12 years ago I used to work in the humanitarian crisis in Haiti for both peoples. So I have some idea how we work. That's what's going on. But right now, I find out, I was listening to Mr. Fulton. It was really the most realistic thing we could hear about Haiti. That's the reality. So I wonder, and I'm going to ask the panel, what they have, what they are thinking and doing for to reach the population. Because the population is just like an hostage of the political situation. And it seems like nobody really understands what's going on because the people is not really worried about political thing, political situation. is about the baby, as Mr. Fulton said. So did somebody think about people, really the population, resources for them, not about really political uh, actors in Haiti? OK. Um Panelists, uh, please feel free to jump in. Okay. Uh, on the job agenda, I think uh, there is some agreement uh, among both the government and the development partners that uh, after housing and rubble, uh, creation of jobs is the uh, first, uh, the third priority, or you know, in parallel with the other ones. Uh, the U.S., the IDB, uh, the bank have worked together uh, in terms of creating. Uh, at least four new economic zones, uh, and uh, one of them is pretty well advanced, uh, some uh, uh, and would create, I think, about 22,000 jobs, if initially, I remember well. Initially, yeah. Initially. Uh, so uh, this problem is very much in our mind and is very high in our agenda. We're doing uh, a lot to, 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 to move on that agenda. But you can't just do it uh, from our side. In the business environment, mm -hmm. um, the establishment of rule of law are absolutely essential for uh, investments to, 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 to set in Haiti. And the second thing is cholera. Cholera epidemic is not just a health problem. It's a major <coughs> obstacle to uh, the creation of jobs and the installation of new, uh, of new companies. Tur there is no tourism in a country which has cholera. Uh, and tourism is said to be maybe the second uh, business opportunity in the country after apparel. But even apparel, if you are a Korean or, uh, uh, or a Japanese or whoever wants to invest in Haiti, you don't know the country, but you think, oh, do I want to send my staff into a, a country where uh, um, uh, cholera still has a, an epidemic status? So uh, we have to do three things. Number one, we have to deal with the cholera as soon as possible. We have to ch improve the business environment, and we have to help <coughs> the government establish the, the rule of law. Uh, the second question is how to reach the population and how to deal in this political transition. In some ways, uh, Haiti is a little lucky that uh, the Interim Commission for the Recovery of, of Haiti uh, was established uh, before this uh, crisis, because somehow in that forum uh, where um, uh, Haitian society is represented with half of the, number, uh, the members, it's a relatively insul uh, is a, is a, is an environment, a forum, relatively insulated from this political crisis. And uh, uh, the committee has met during the crisis. Projects have been approved and are moving on in spite of the crisis. Although, of course, when the implementa implementing agency is a ministry, uh, the effects of the crisis in the ministry are now apparent. But uh, somehow, this interim commission served us all well and served the population well during this interim time. Maybe I can just add a, a few words to that. Uh, um, agree, agree with you that youth uh, are a target audience that we have to address, <coughs> both through education and, and through employment. Um, and uh, the education system in Haiti, as you know, is, is, um, is in very poor shape. Uh, it's, it's essentially private. Um, uh, any Haitians, most Haitians who get advanced degrees, any kind of college degrees, leave the country. Um, there are not many opportunities there that would attract uh, a well-educated Haitian to stay. 
and, and that has to change. I mean, one way of changing that is is indeed to strengthen uh, the government, not just in the political sense that we've been discussing here today, but also in a technical sense. Um, uh, Haiti lost, uh, I think, something like 17 percent of its government workers were killed in the earthquake. And, and the ones who were working at 5 o'clock in the evening were probably the, the more dedicated ones mm -hmm. instead of the no-shows. Um, uh, a number of others <coughs> uh, who had visas just took off. By some estimates, as much as 40% of the government workforce uh, left. Uh, and <coughs> to rebuild that, uh, to train them, uh, I was talking to the bank the other day about this. There's a lot of money from donors to go and strengthen various institutions and where we've already done this uh, like in the central bank and the ministry of finance it's shown good results but there's no overall plan for civil service reform uh, and 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 that's uh, we're putting that on the agenda uh, and hopefully you know you, you need to raise salaries you need to have civil service tests you need to have other things to, to, to make government employment attractive and then and then hopefully uh, retain bright bright Haitians um, in government service uh, women, uh, the birth rates in Haiti have shot up since the earthquake. Uh, the, the, the fairly healthy economic growth Haiti had before uh, the earthquake was eaten up by, uh, you know, their per capita GDP went down because of population growth, even though it had slowed somewhat uh, then. And, and basically, um, when women are educated and are employable, their birth rates drop. And, and, and that would be a good thing for Haiti uh, to happen. Haiti has a lot of disabled. Uh, uh, they had a lot of disabled even before the earthquake. The earthquake added to that. If you've been there, uh, it's not a very handicapped friendly country. Um, and uh, we have some, some funding to, to, to try to change that and so do others. So uh, there are target groups that, that, that need to be reached. Um, and, and on this question of sovereignty, you know, uh, um, I think the IHRC mechanism is a good mechanism that uh, protects um, uh, the interests of the government there. Also, um, and donors, and including NGOs. NGOs can participate, and some of them do. Uh, because once you go through the IHRC process, you get the government permits as part of your plan. Um, and I think it's been a good institution, and uh, it was a little slow to staff up. It's, it's picked up its pace now. And I think going forward, uh, it's doing a good job in coordinating uh, complex things like rubble removal, health, housing. They, they've recently done some very good planning in that regard. So um, I, I think I think that's a good institution. I'll stop here now and see if anybody else wants to add to your. But, yeah, I, I think what is critical in Haiti is the creation of a strong state with the capacity uh, to do what it says it's going to do. And we don't have that. It was already weak before the earthquake, and now it is obviously even weaker. Uh, and this is not simply a, a Haitian problem. It's also a problem of the international community insofar as the programs that we've had for the past 30 or 40 years have really emphasized uh, channeling resources through NGOs. And that inevitably has undermined the solidity of the state. As people who work in the government, and in particular those who are competent, they move to the NGOs. They have better salaries. Uh, they have the opportunity to travel. They have the opportunity to drive uh, nice cars, etc. So, so I think the NGOs uh, cannot be, in fact, the platform for the development of Haiti. They can be there to help. But uh, you need a strong state, in particular in terms of its economic capacity and uh, its legal capacity. One of the issues that we see, for instance, with uh, the earthquake is that uh, no one knows who owns what. And this is not just a legal matter, it's really a political matter. Uh, who's well connected ultimately owns that piece of land. That's the reality. So you need to change that, and that again links, links to the political situation. So uh, when we are talking about the reconstruction of Haiti, we really are talking about the construction of a new state and the capacity of that state uh, to reach to the population and to begin to think about bridging the gap between the very few people who are indeed privileged and the vast majority. And in my mind to do so, uh, the prime sector is really agriculture. Uh, that has to be, in my mind, the fundamental uh, driving force of uh, the Haitian economy the apparel industry, those sectors, they will arrive 
in, in a different way. But I think agriculture, in particular, uh, food production for Haitians is absolutely critical. Otherwise, in the very near future, we will face again food riots. Uh, the cost of food is going to go up in a political situation that is already volatile, and I'm afraid that this is a recipe uh, for uh, serious trouble. A couple of things. One is that it does seem to me that the IHRC provides a mechanism which perhaps has not been used thus far to make some of these transitions. So that every grant and every project the IHRC approves, it seems to me, should carry within it a, an element of transition from whoever's running it, the NGO, to the state so that one portion of that grant and project should be aimed at building state capacity. And the second is that one portion of that project should be aimed at decentralization. <clears throat> Ensure that it doesn't all stay in Port-au-Prince. And I think the three quarters, the economic quarters, <coughs> is, is important. But beyond that, when you're giving a grant for major construction <coughs> infrastructure, a portion should be for decentralization. The other is that, that if, there's, if I have a criticism of the, the process of reconstruction, it's not so much that, that you haven't moved a million three out of the tents and into permanent housing. It's that the, up until today, there's still no resettlement housing <coughs> strategy adopted by the IHRC and the entire community, which you're then following. And that has not been communicated to the people inside the camps, which would give them the kind of certainty that at some point down the road, this is where I fall, and this is where my future lies. And I think that that needs to be done as, urgent, as soon as possible. And the other is the transparency and communication from the IHRC out, so that those 20 young people know what has been done and what it, the future might hold for them in terms of jobs. And finally, you mentioned, uh, we haven't really talked about women, but the fact is, is that the earthquake and the, the process since the earthquake has been one where the increase in sexual abuse, increase in, 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 in threats to women, and you talked about the increase in terms of births. There's also been an increase in maternal mortality. And Haiti began as one of the countries with the highest level of maternal mortality in the hemisphere. I mean, Haiti and, and Honduras and, and, um, and Bolivia. Um, and it does seem to me that that needs to be a stronger priority uh, in everybody's mind as you move forward. Uh, Mar Marlene, I don't think we answered your question on, um, on communication. If I can just say, there, there's sort of two forms of communication in Haiti. Uh, there's, there's the radio and there's the rumor mill. Um, and uh, we have found, uh, had a good deal of success at fighting cholera by using uh, the radio and cell phone messages yeah. that have actually changed behavior of people. Uh, for the better, and uh, there's a lot of rumors that went around about cholera, you know, you could catch it sitting next to somebody, you can't basically, and other things, and, and um, so there's been some success there. So I think those tools can be used, uh, can be used more going forward uh, to, to, to communicate to people, uh, because the rumor mill can be, can be very, uh, very wrong, uh, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Something I remember. Uh, Marlene? Uh, we're going to have to move forward and give others a chance. Uh, we have one question uh, from uh, someone watching on the internet that I want to ask, and we have a question right back here that will pair up for the next round. And this one f is from uh, an individual affiliated with the Club Madrid, and it links on something that uh, I think Mark Schneider just mentioned. So I would pose the question more to uh, Mr. Abrantes and, Mr. and Ambassador Adams. Very succinct what is being done to ensure the recovery process supports uh, Haiti's institutional strengthening um, and then could you ask your question now yes uh, good morning my name is Angela Bruce Rayburn I'm from Oxfam America I was just wondering at the base of all of this discussion is there any opportunity for the international community to consider just social protection for families if 80% of the population is unemployed, that means that there are thousands of people who cannot feed their children every day because they don't have any money. And I'm just wondering, in terms of the way we think about things in the US, is there an opportunity for some kind of structure that allows people to be able to access food, 
just on a, just, I don't know, one meal a day. Anything so that people don't have to put their kids to bed at night hungry. Um, this is something that I, I wonder about a lot. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Let me uh, first on the uh, building in the rebuilding the institutions. In terms of the World Bank specifically, uh, because of our specialty, we have focused in rebuilding uh, capacity in the Ministry of Finance, in the Internal Revenue Service, in the Central Bank, uh, which are the core of the economic and uh, financial policies of the country. And indeed, we did uh, actually build 500, uh, 500 posts. Uh, workstations for the staff. We have been able to recover uh, the databases of all the civil servants and the database of all the retirees to be able to start paying the civil servants again and pay the pensions again. Uh, fortunately, the uh, central bank was not completely uh, uh, washed away, so uh, they had uh, fewer needs. Um, we are all uh, in agreement in IHRC, and uh, Ambassador Adams has just talked. I think uh, the uh, reform of the state will be in the first uh, uh, range of the discussions with the new government, and I think that we all think alike in, in, that, in that purpose. I'd also like to address the question of um, the social protection. Social protection programs exist in Haiti. Uh, the major one is the school feeding program, in which uh, the US, Spain, uh, the EU, the bank collaborate. The bank alone is feeding 75,000 kids a day uh, with one warm meal at school, uh, but this is complemented by other, other countries, so it's much wider. There's also a very widespread uh, series of programs which is called Cash for Work, uh, which basically uh, provides a minimum income for families in uh, difficult situations or who, which have been displaced in camps. Uh, the question on these are two. The number one is identification. It's very difficult. Uh, there's no actually registry uh, of these people so that you can uh, actually distribute these programs without massive fraud. Uh, and the second thing is the sustainability uh, midterm. You can do this for a year or two, but then who's going to foot the bill to continue these programs? These programs are easier to create than they are to, to discontinue. Thank you. Yeah, let me just just add to that. I mean, after the after the earthquake, uh, USAID uh, fed four million people in the f first three months. Um, that was distorting the economy somewhat. Um, you know, but this this sort of free donor food. Uh, so uh, we've cut that back, and and now we're we're feeding only about 1.6 million, mostly uh, children, school-aged children, small children, lactating mothers, uh, the disabled. HIV infected people, orphans, and that sort of thing. For the rest, uh, we are giving out food vouchers and doing and doing cash for work, uh, so that so that normal economy functions there, rather than than one that's heavily distorted by by donor aid. Um, there are other. There's a social cluster that's uh, run by UN agencies that addresses um, other other inequities. It's not perfect, but I, but I think uh, I think it's doing better. Some surveys show that malnutrition has dropped somewhat since prior to the earthquake, uh, but there are still gaps out there that need to be addressed. Just um, because you, you just mentioned that that point, it seems to me that it's it's very important in terms of the feeding program to recognize that the, the cycle. And and I know that USAID has already identified the, with its famine early warning system that April, May, and June are likely to be months where Haiti is going to require more than it currently is with respect to food assistance. And, and therefore, it seems to me that, that the, what you just mentioned, figuring out a way to ensure that more of the need is met by Haitian farmers and Haitian produ agricultural production uh, should begin now. And the only other thing is about social protection is that, you know, Haiti, the remittances from Haitians outside the country continue to be fundamental for people to survive in Haiti. And what I remember the World Bank did initially was looked at the question of whether conditional cash transfers, like the Brazilian Bolsa Familia, et cetera, could be in instated in Haiti without regard to the weakness of the, and my understanding was that it could. And I'm curious as to where, where that is relative to building on sort of the pattern of remittances 
but upping the level of assist number of families that would receive. Uh, on the remittances, what we saw was that it was a big jump uh, to much higher levels uh, than the year before after the, the earthquake, and then it started to normalize, and it's now about at the same level as before. On the Bolsa Familia, we did send our teams there, uh, and the conditions for a program like that are not in, on the ground because of the registering and the, and the roster of people. But what we're doing now is actually creating those registers that would mm -hmm. permit right. uh, such <coughs> program to be uh, installed in the near future. Okay, um, I see a question here and uh, in the back right there. Good morning. Uh, my name is Alfred Toussaint with Nova Technology Partners uh, based in um, uh, rest in Virginia. First of all, thank you for this great panel, um, and also thank you for, all for, for, for those of you that uh, are uh, working on uh, Haiti-related uh, um, uh, projects and, uh, and initiatives. Um, one of our Haiti business development practice uh, client is a global uh, furniture company that um, uh, Ambassador Adams uh, somewhat referred to earlier. Uh, they will be um, hiring somewhere in the order of 3,000 uh, Haitians uh, in the next couple of years or so on, in the industrial park near, near Cap Haitien, so away from, from Port-au-Prince. My question is about the uh, leapfrog uh, scenario that uh, Mr. Abramtes uh, introduced uh, earlier. Uh, the question is, how can Haiti increase uh, the likelihood of that scenario, uh, given A, we have a new government that's coming in, and B, <laughs> Uh, we have Dr. Fatten's pessimistic, but realistic outlook. Okay, and the other question is right back here. Good morning. My name is Jean-Michel Voltaire. I'm with the Justice Department. Um, <clears throat> most people who know Haiti knows that uh, corruption is the disease that, dis that is destroying the country. And we all want to have a state, a strong state, but the state has to be responsible and accountable to the people. Is the international community ready this time to transform Haiti into a responsible state where anti-corruption will be the key, the essential elements of all of the programs? Okay, uh, Mr. Brantes, maybe the leapfrog question. Yes, I mean the leapfrog question is the responsibility uh, uh, of the leadership of the country. Uh, whoever gets elected either has the will and has the, the charisma, uh, has the will to do it and has the charisma to bring the people along. These two things are necessary, not only that you want to do it, you also have to be able to bring the nation behind it because some of these reforms may hurt the, some, uh, uh, some interests and therefore you, the you know, progressive leader has to be able to bring uh, the population behind uh, and not be boycotted or ousted because of the reforms he needs to do. And those have to do with you know, establishment of the rule of law, the <coughs> improved business environment. Uh, without that, uh, you cannot uh, actually uh, improve the situation of, uh, of the foreign investment. <coughs> or even national investment for that sake. On the corruption, uh, yes, uh, it's a lot has been talked about it, but uh, if you compare uh, with what happened uh, with 2006, in the past three or four years, a number of important laws and, uh, and agencies <coughs> have been put in place. The anti-corruption agency, the law uh, regulating uh, 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 procurement, which are key, uh, pieces of such anti-corruption uh, uh, or gov good governance uh, set up. The uh, auditing institutions have been put in place. Do they function well? Not yet. Uh, are they in place? Yes, they are. Uh, our budget support operations that we regularly uh, uh, provide the, the government with uh, all include step-by-step uh, -step advances in those agendas. The last one, for instance, had uh, very clear triggers in terms of uh, what was the proportion of uh, government contracts which had been had to be uh, signed under the new uh, procurement law and reviewed by the procurement commission. It also included uh, measures to improve the transparency of the transfers from the government to the electricity setter, sector, which you know is a big uh, black hole. Um, therefore, you know we will 
We are in all of our operations. We try to tighten uh, and improve and reinforce the governance structures, but it, it takes a little time to do. If I can just comment on that, I think one of the one of the big challenges. I mean, um, the whole rule of law area is, is fragile there. Uh, Haiti needs many more police than they have. The police that were trained before the earthquake have a pretty good reputation and I think are, are, are doing fairly well. Uh, we need to greatly increase their numbers, though, over the next few years, and there is training going on. We, we, we're training about 700 uh, additional police every nine months, and we're going to pick up the numbers there. Um, the, uh, the prisons are a, are a human rights uh, problem in many cases, and uh, we are – Canadians just finished building a new prison. United States is going to build a new women's prison and we're going to refurbish two others. Uh, but we also then need to train prison officials and set up a better, a better structure there. Um, the hardest part, I think, in the rule of law area is the judiciary, is getting, getting kind of um, really justice through, um, uh, through, through courts and through, through uh, uh, using the law. And, and that's going to be a challenge because <coughs> while there are some technical parts of that, uh, the vast majority of work is really arm twisting to get to, to get people. Uh, and frankly, in Haiti, the people who have money like the current system uh, because it works in their favor. So I, I think that's going to be a real challenge going on. Okay, um, Mark and Robert, do you yeah, have uh, just on that comments? on that last point? I think that, that uh, Ambassador Adams indicated quite accurately that the judiciary and I would say prosecutors are the sort of the, the, the greatest gap in terms of building a Haitian uh, judicial and justice sector that operates for the people. Um, and there, though, there is one thing that's very important, which is that two years ago, the parliament did pass at the government's request the creation of a Conseil Supérieur de la Magistrature with the authority to set standards for judges and vet existing judges against those standards. If they didn't meet them, retrain them, or if they were corrupt, remove them. And that is really the vehicle that is available to the next government to move forward. And that's one, I think, one of the, the greatest failures of the current government there was the failure to name the people to that council and to move forward using it as a way to reform the judiciary. <coughs> yeah, and, and one additional thing, I mean, corruption is not just the government, it's, it's the system. Mm -hmm. uh, because you have a fusion between private and governmental officials mm -hmm. uh, and it feeds on itself. You know, if you want to do business in Haiti, there are certain things that everyone knows in Haiti that you have to do, period. Uh, and those are, again, you're moving around, you're, you know, uh, as we say in Creole. So that's very much a systemic issue. To just concentrate on the government, which is important to concentrate on, right. misses the other part. And the two have to be mutually supportive. And this is precisely why it's difficult to have a judiciary that has the capacity to enforce the rules. It's not just because of the government, but as the ambassador said, there are certain interests that benefits from the crisis and that benefits from that very Byzant Byzantine uh, 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 way of doing business, which is not that Byzantine if you are inside the process itself. Yeah. Okay, um, we have, um, do we have a question in the audience? We have, okay, we'll take this uh, question <coughs> right back here, Liz. But first, uh, we have one from uh, uh, someone viewing online. Uh, the question is, can anyone suggest immediate things that can be done to bolster food sovereignty issues which would improve life in the provinces? I ask this because of the point that Robert Faton made, and I would just add on to this that um, in 2009, the government of Haiti issued a report that said ev uh, every 10 percent investment in agriculture creates 40,000 jobs. And I'm just wondering if, if uh, from a World Bank and U.S. perspective, one, do you accept that assessment of the Haitian government, and uh, is job creation in the agricultural sector um, realistic in view of, uh, of, of uh, investing in it? And the next question, please. Hi, my name is Leah Pillsbury, and I'm with the Department of State and an office that works on UN issues. And my question is related to the UN peacekeepers who are in Haiti, and I'm wondering if you guys can comment at all on both how you think that they're doing 
now and what role you'd like to see Manusta playing as the country rebuilds in the future. Thank you. Um, and I'll start on, um, on both of those uh, briefly. Um, yeah, I mean, I mentioned earlier agriculture is, is uh, an area where I think we can greatly increase uh, incomes in, in Haiti. 60% uh, of Haitians are farmers, sort of. Uh, these are small one hectare farms, very inefficient. Haiti's never going to be, uh, be, be what it was two centuries ago, an agricultural powerhouse. Uh, but, and currently they import about 50% of their food. Um, um, but you can, you can um, do some <coughs> import substitution, particularly in beans, rice. Uh, there are a few export crops that, uh, that can, can be done, mangoes, uh, shade coffee, perhaps cacao. Some people say citrus. Some people say sugar cane, although uh, I think we think cacao and, and mangoes are, are better. But the farmers need better uh, roads. Uh, they need farmer cooperatives. They need inputs. <coughs> Um, and so uh, th there's some legislative and other changes that need to be made to, to really maximize farmer. But it's, it's not that hard on the relative scale of things to, to, to increase farm income uh, rapidly. Uh, and, and, and certainly we want to do that, have Haiti produce more food. Uh, food security, uh, they, they are part of the f global food security program. We, we monitor that. Uh, because Haiti had had the highest malnutrition in the hemisphere before the earthquake, so so that is on our, our radar range. Uh, talking about Manusta, you know, I think Manusta has done a terrific job down there. It's staffed largely by troops from from South America. The head of Manusta, Manusta Edmond Moulet, is is uh, terrific, um, and and they do a lot of good stuff. They have gotten, um, of course, uh, a bad rep because it's claimed they brought cholera to Haiti. Um, there's, there's no definitive proof that that happened, uh, but the UN has recently hired a group of four independent epidemiologists, who I think are all from Central and South America, to do an unbiased look at this and try to come up. The, uh, our own CDC took a look and could not establish that. That doesn't mean it didn't, didn't happen. But, uh, um, and frankly, Haiti was ripe uh, for cholera. Haiti is perhaps never had cholera in its history. Um, and um, so its introduction by any means would spread rapidly because there are no natural immunities. The good news on cholera, and this is probably the reason it's dropped out of the headlines in the press, is uh, the fight against it is, 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 is going, I think, pretty well. There was a massive international effort uh, um, coordinated by the Ministry of Health there and also um, uh, with UN agencies, PAHO, the United States has contributed a lot of money. And basically, the, the mortality rates uh, um, have been dropping. New cases have been dropping. Cholera is very easy to prevent if you, if you basically drink clean water, clean chlorinated water. It's also very easy to treat if you get treatment early enough. And so we think uh, the, the mortality rates start about 10% of those who got serious hospitalized cases <coughs> is now down to about 2%. And we think we can drive them closer to 1%, which is, which is doing pretty well there. Um, j just to clarify, there was a bit of a nuance in the question. It wasn't food security. Yeah. It was food sovereignty, which I believe would be Haitians being able to feed themselves basic staples. Um, and I know that this has b become a very large issue in Haiti, in large part because of the amount of food mm -hmm. that Haiti must import now and has no control over the prices. And I know Oxfam has done a lot of work on this. Mm -hmm. and looking at the uh, deleterious impact of subsidized uh, cereals and rice and so on coming into Haiti. Uh, Mark, do you have Yeah, I mean, th there's one area where, um, where or I think that there's some action that the United States could take. Um, uh, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to remove in the next uh, several months the subsidy that the U.S. government provides to rice farmers uh, in the United States. Um, but there's no reason why in Haiti uh, the U.S. government could not support a subsidy for Haitian farmers that would be equal to that uh, in order to uh, enable them to boost rice production in the Artibonite and other areas. Uh, rice continues to be one of the major uh, areas of import. And I'm told that people who know this much better than I do, that uh, the way that it can be structured would not be a violation of WTO. Um, and so that would be one area. Um, the other, I think the, uh, Tom indicated several of the other areas where, where Haiti 
in the agricultural area could do much more. The only other point that I would make in terms of um, in terms of cholera is that there now as a result of the massive response really there's I think it's 256 cholera treatment centers that have been established across the country uh, and I would simply urge that as the uh, hopefully the disease is contained that you don't lose the benefit of that infrastructure and that there are plans underway to expand the those cholera treatment centers into uh, community health clinics that would be available f to deal with the, the normal public health problems facing uh, the people in Haiti. Yeah, on agriculture, when we are talking about uh, food sovereignty, we're not just talking about food, obviously, because we are talking about the whole infrastructure that mm -hmm. needs to be restored. I mean, you're talking about irrigation. You're talking about the provisions of roads to the peasants. You're talking about small markets where they can. So it's not just a question of food. It involves all kinds of other investments mm -hmm. that would have <coughs> backward and forward linkages with the rest of the economy. So I think I it's a huge thing that I think should be the, my view, the, the prevalent sector. Now, <coughs> on MINUSTA, I think that in Haiti there is great disenchantment with MINUSTA uh, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, the question, obviously, is if uh, Minusta has to go, and eventually, at one point, it will have to go, what will be the replacing organism? And that remains very unclear. Is the Haitian uh, government going to recreate an army? And if you recreate an army, what kind of army? Uh, what kind of resources would be given to the army? So you have all kinds of questions that remain unanswered. But there is a very strong and increasingly so nationalistic sentiment, feeling that Minusta is an intrusion into uh, Haiti, and that uh, the sooner the better uh, when they exit. But the reality is, is how do you in, how do you uh, ensure some form of transition period, and what kind of police or army is going to be created? And the fear, obviously, is that if you recreate an army, you are back to very uh, uh, nasty forms of politics. Uh, because if we haven't had a coup, I mean, fr yes. from within Haiti, it's because we haven't had an army. There is, in fact, on the question of the army, the, and, and how do you move the transition <coughs> when Minusta ultimately downsizes and is removed, th there's the actual plan for the Haitian National Police provides for the different elements, whether it's Coast Guard, or different capabilities that would sure. permit, hopefully, at some point, the HNP, without creating an army, to uh, provide security for the Haitian citizens. The other point is that economically, you really can't create dual structures in the security sector in Haiti uh, and finance it with the, the resources that a very poor country has. You'd be duplicating procurement, management, um, recruiting, all of the things that Haiti doesn't can't afford, but you can have a a, a a police structure that fulfills the functions of border control, coast guard, etc., and also that avoids the kind of um, potential political threat that the army in Haiti has had in the past. <coughs> Just two quick comments on on agriculture. Um, as you know, in Davos uh, this week uh, there will be a session on Haiti and there was a, uh, an economic uh, paper prepared uh, for that meeting uh, and I encourage you to uh, uh, following, follow up on it uh, when it is published, uh, I guess next week or even this week still. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are a little more optimistic on agriculture than uh, uh, Ambassador Adams uh, is. Uh, they do believe it's probably the second largest uh, opportunity for uh, growth in, in the country. Uh, they don't talk about this uh, self-sustaining uh, 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 or sovereignty issue. They do think is that they have an export, they have a capacity to export some kind of niche products and high value yep. products uh, uh, and that, that should be the direction of uh, the agriculture there. Um, the bank itself has been doing a lot in community-driven uh, development projects in the rural areas and this means actually offering 
uh, two things. One is giving the uh, small farmers the stru infrastructures, the access roads to the markets and so forth uh, to keep to make them uh, more uh, competitive. And number two, our next phase is to actually associate them into cooperatives so this, that this problem of small scale uh, is at least uh, diminished and that they organize themselves in co-ops and share resources and share uh, uh, capacity. And then finally, introducing these co-ops into uh, the food, uh, into the market chain. So uh, promoting contracts between these co-ops and the supermarkets and so forth. So we're trying to do a lot with community-driven uh, uh, projects to, to help the small farmer uh, get into the modern uh, agriculture society and into the market. Thank you. Okay, and, and at this point, uh, Mr. Abrantes has to leave us to keep another engagement. Um, but we'll soldier on here. Uh, the, the gentleman back here, uh, two rows from the back on the aisle, you had a question earlier. Do you still have your question? Okay, uh, before you ask yours, we have one directly for Ambassador Adams from Patrick Hickey of the U.S. Uh, Government Accounting Office. Uh. <laughs> and he asked, um, Good luck. <laughs> I'm in trouble. He asked very specifically, in addition to the uh, U.S. Uh, 1.15 billion pledged at the donors conference by the U.S., we also made available 406 million in reprogrammed funds. Is this 406 million subject to the IHRC and Haitian government, and is it subject to review? Uh, that's a good question. Um, let, me, let me just sort of summarize the funding because it is a little complicated, as, as Patrick uh, probably knows. Um, since the, the January 12th earthquake, uh, the United States government has spent $1.1 billion in humanitarian uh, relief. This was largely in the emergency phase. Um, some of that was to reimburse the U.S. military and others who, who, uh, who went down there. The $406 uh, million in, in reprogrammed funds, uh, really sort of part of our FY10 uh, budget, uh, whether that went through the IHRC or not depended on whether it was funding an old program, a pre-IHRC pre program, and, and, and uh, it was added to, say, our existing agriculture or other programs, or whether it was a new program. If it was a new program, we did, we did, uh, we did uh, run it through the IHRC. Um, then in addition to that money, um, the Secretary at the March 31st pledged uh, an additional $1.15 billion for new money for reconstruction. And so far we've spent uh, $332 million of that uh, in, 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 uh, in the last year, the last calendar year. So this is $2.656 uh, billion towards relief and recovery. We also have the FY11 regular appropriation coming uh, and so forth. So. Um, there is there is a pretty big pipeline still of money, which is a good thing. Uh, but uh, y you know, th the question of Haiti, Haiti's going to need large scale assistance uh, for the next decade, uh, in reality. And and so it's it's kind of every year we're going to need another bite of the apple. And I think as we as we draw down the supplemental funds, uh, 2013 will be an important budget year for us to go back to the Congress. Um, down the road, uh, there was, you know, when, when there's a donors conference like the one in New York where you come up with these, these big numbers, um, I think it does uh, create false expectations. Uh, I mean, donors conferences want to create hope, let the people of Haiti know they're not abandoned, but at the same time, um, people think um, they should see it sooner rather than later. So it's a balancing act, and I think we have to be realistic. Uh, about Haiti. I am overall optimistic, and let me just explain why. If you take a look at Haiti um, and the Dominican Republic, about 40 years ago they were at the same place. In fact, Haiti was, was a bit ahead of the Dominican Republic economically. Um, um, the Dominican Republic, as you know, has, has taken off. Uh, um, Haiti has gone the other direction. And when I talk to um, my development economist friends and say, what was the difference? Um, I get all kinds of answers, but the best answer I get is that uh, uh, the Dominican Republic got slightly better dictators. And uh, I tell this story um, because you don't need perfect government uh, to advance economically. We'd like, we'd like that. It would make it easier, it'd probably make it quicker. But Haiti can, can advance uh, without the best government in the world, without the best human rights record in the world. Uh, and, and without uh, other things, uh, without cleaning up all of its corruption. Um, so, uh, you know, if you look at it that way, 
uh, the United States became the richest country in the world by having an annual uh, growth rate of 1.7 percent from the dawn of the industrial era in 1820 till the present. And that's what you need is kind of that growth sustained and compounded year after year. And if we can get that in Haiti, Haiti will, will be fine. Um, and I think that's the trick here. So sorry for that long-winded answer. Oh, thank you very much. Um, would, that, would you like to ask your question? Sure, yeah, I'll ask it. Um, my name is Skylar Badnock. I work for a nonprofit organization named Build On. We uh, build primary schools in southern Haiti. And it's, we've been doing it for the last five years. And I was in Haiti before the earthquake. So I've been doing a lot of thinking about the country. And one of the things that I was thinking about is the returns on investment. Um, and I, I think about that because I think of the, the $15 million that went into the election. I think that many of us are not happy with the return on that investment. Uh, so my question to all the panelists is, if you were to invest your personal money, not U.S. government money, not your organization's money, but your personal money into the country, what one place would you put it to ensure your best return on uh, economic investment or your, your political investment or your social investment? Do they actually have to commit a sum? Uh, just one. Just answer? one. Okay. Mark, why don't you start? Sure. Um, <clears throat> first, it's an unfair question. Uh, <laughs> because the government has a responsibility, in fact, to do things which don't necessarily produce an immediate return on investment. <clears throat> if you build a road farm to market, that may be absolutely essential for building agriculture down the road. Similarly, in terms of education, that you may have an impact on the economy, but again, it may take a long time. I guess if I were to put my money tomorrow, I'd put it on girls' education. Well, I would put it in agriculture. I, I, would, uh, I would create capital. Um, Haiti has, uh, the banks are awash with capital, they don't lend. Um, I would create new banks for micro-lending and other things, um, and we are doing that, in fact. Mortgages for the middle-class people can afford it. Um, helping the small shop owners who had their entire inventory wiped out by the earthquake to rebuild it and, and get back into business. Uh, I, think, uh, I think those things would probably not bring me as much personal profit, but I think they would do the most good in Haiti. Okay. Um, Let's take the two questions here on this side, um, very in close proximity. Wait, wait for the mic. It's right thank behind you. you. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you very much for your very insightful presentations. Um, my name is Kislin Jamali Shegestal, and I'm an attorney of Haitian descent. Um, and um, I just returned from a long-term contract in Haiti um, that ended up just a couple of weeks ago. and. My question is this, I mean, I think that there are a lot of people of goodwill at the table. And one of the things that President Obama said many years ago that struck me, as I thought it related to Haiti, was the fact that you shouldn't question the goodwill or the love of the country um, of the person who's sitting across from you. And I think that even when it comes to the international donors, I believe that those who are involved in Haiti want to see the country prosper, even if it's a question of making it um, a platform for future investments. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. And I think on the other end that the Haitians are also very patient. Um, people say that, well, Haitians would like to see results faster. But I, I don't know that there are many more patient people in the world. Haitians take, know that it takes time for things to happen, and they are willing to see it happen. I think what might be missing is a conversation with the people that we're trying to help, stakeholder outreach. And I'm not quite sure that I see a willingness yet on the part of the different actors, whether international donors or the government, to actually engage the people that we are purporting to help. And actually not only get their buy-in, but also keep them updated and make them understand why we are where we are and why things are not progressing as fast as they are. So my question is, is there a strategy and how important is that strategy um, by all the different entities that are working on Haiti to do stakeholder outreach in a way that not only people become aware of what you're doing and why, but also they can help you find the better, not the best, but the better solutions, better than those that have been implemented thus far. Thank you. Okay. And the second question, please. 
Um, my name is Philip Wern. I'm, I'm a member of the Haiti Support Group. We seek to amplify the views of progressive civil society organizations in Haiti, mostly in Europe, but in North America to some extent too. I'd just like to follow up on what the ambassador said. These are your exact words, ambassador. People who have money like the current system. You were referring to the judiciary, I think, in that instance, but does that not apply to a much broader extent in Haitian society? Um, basically, you know, Paul Collier, the UN political officer in Haiti, they say Haiti's a failed state. But failed for who? It isn't failed for the people who live up on the hill. I think they've got the state they want. And Dr. Faton sort of referred to this. Uh, they've, they've got the state they want. And I think in basically changing Haiti, surely we have to really challenge them. It perhaps refers back to what you said, Dominican Republic's had a better class of dictator. Haiti's had a very poor class of economic and political dicta dictatorship. And if we do not do that, and I, I see some, I, I share a lot of Dr. Faton's real, real issues here. If we do not do that, I see a lot of money pouring into Haiti now, reconstruction money that is just reinforcing those people they are getting the contracts. They are the people who basically have the political connections to claim they own the stuff that has no, the cadastre does not tell us what land is owned, etc., etc. They are the people asserting themselves. And I think there's a real fear. Is there not a real fear? Could there be a real fear that we are just reinforcing those structures through these massive amount, amounts of money going into Haiti now? And how do we change that? Um, they're looking at me, so um, <laughs> um, uh, those are both good questions. Let me deal with the first one first. On uh, we, we have funded uh, NDI and others to do uh, outreach to, to kind of create, uh, you know, help people, local people get organized to speak to their government and get the things they want out of it. Uh, there is a, you know, Americans are very good at this, pressuring your congressman and writing petitions and all that. Haitians aren't, and you're right, the, the, the target, the government, the Haitian government is hard for them to hit. Um, now, one way to do that is through the political process, but Haitians don't have as much faith in the political process. They don't have much faith in their government. They have much more faith in NGOs, for example, polls show. Um, so that's, that's something that needs to be developed. I think um, the decentralization will help. Um, when the center doesn't work in a number of countries I've worked in, doesn't work particularly well, uh, you go you go create decentralized you help mayors who want to want to solve their town's problems you empower them get them resources and that's the big gap right now they don't have resources uh, but but you know in theory they're going to get them soon um, and as they solve problems they get more political power and move up and that's the way it's supposed to work uh, and and hopefully it'll work in Haiti plus you know in, in our country and in most other countries, the services that really count, you know, your police, your water, your fire, those are all locally provided, and they're much better provided locally than they would be from some, from the big national federal government. And Haiti's no exception to that. They need more local government. So uh, I think you need both. You need, you need to decentralize government, but you also need then to train people uh, how, to, how, to, how to interact with that. And, and there are some efforts there, but they, there need to be more. I don't think there's an overall plan, although there is a lot of money uh, set aside for decentralization, and and I think there's strategies being worked on, as we speak. Um, on the economic thing, you know, you hear that there the 20 families that run Haiti, or the 12 families that run Haiti, or the 15, uh, uh, I don't know uh, how many there really are, uh, block economic progress and need to be broken. Um, uh, I don't think it's that simple. Uh, some of these families uh, are investing in progressive ventures. And I think the trick there will be um, basically, you know, and others, others defend their rice bowl. Um, uh, Haiti has the highest container shipping costs in the Caribbean, like five times the average, uh, because the port has kind of got five concessionaires who don't want to give up their, um, their rice bowl. And it's those kinds of economic uh, dominance in, in little areas that stymie other people. They, ra they, they raise the cost of food far more than, than U.S. Uh, food subsidies, for example. And, and, uh, and you need to, to, to knock down especially those kinds of barriers that, uh, that prohibit economic growth. Uh, electricity um, is a mess because it's poorly managed. It needs to be privatized, the management of it privatize the management of the airport, privatize the ports, probably build a new port. 
And these are going to be things that require independent regulators, new laws, and a lot of political will to, to uh, put through. Um, in theory, um, the government has accepted the need to do this, and uh, the IDB and others are working on proposals and, uh, and, and ways on doing it. Uh, but that's something that has not moved very far um, because of this government impasse, and, and that needs to be brought up higher on the agenda as we move forth. Paul Collier has written a very good paper on, on, uh, on the economic opportunities in Haiti, and I don't think he's as pessimistic as you implied there. Um, so does that answer both your questions? All right. Okay. Uh, Mark and Robert, do you have comments on these questions also? Okay. Uh, I think one of the <coughs> fundamental issues is whether the system has reached a point where it has become so irrational that even those out the top have to change their ways. And what, what I'm meaning by so irrational, that if you are a member of the elite, if you are sick, you're in deep doo-doo. You have to exit. You have to go to Miami, you have to go to Cuba, you, you have to go to the Dominican Republic. The, the other thing, uh, if, if you've been lately <laughs> in Paul Press, simply driving, it took me two hours to go to the airport. This is completely irrational. More importantly, what you have is the demographic conditions that have changed the nature of the social system. See, I, I come from one of the privileged groups. When I grew up, Neighborhoods of wealthy people were completely surrounded by trees, by beautiful other houses, etc. This is no longer the case. There is no isolation that can continue. You are, and I was talking to people, and I won't name names, but they say, we are surrounded by them. There is fear, uh, which may lead to irrational outcomes. There is also the reality that people exit. I mean, people from the at the very top, they spend their weekends, you know, in the Dominican Republic or even further up in the mountains, in Fusi, further up, or they go to the beach far away from. So, and, and they feel, in a weird way, in spite of the fact that they have a very good life, material life, they feel besieged. So the question is whether you can continue to live that way. You have security, you know, now you have compounds, gated communities. Haitians in general don't like that, even from the wealthy people. So the question is whether the system has reached a point of crisis that is so intense that from a structural perspective, people have to change their ways, whether they like it or not. So in, in a weird way, this is really the kind of optimistic scenario that I have, that we reach a point of such decay, social, moral, economic, that we can't go further down. So, 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 so my pessimism is really now informed by <laughs> some sort of structural optimism, if you wish. But on the other hand, and again, this is where my pessimistic self comes back, immediately after the earthquake, there was a moment where you thought, well, maybe this is going to do it. That people from the top, they are going to, I mean, people from the top were in the streets, they were dying the same way. They were blooded. They were helping people they had never met. They slept in the street for two or three days. There was a feeling that maybe something would change. Unfortunately, a few months afterwards, the old reflexes are resurfacing. So uh, ultimately, the question is whether that structural problem that faces not just poor people, but those at the very top, compels everyone to start to really think about what the heck they are doing and how they can reach out okay. to one another. So that is, in a weird way, my, my, the optimistic sense that I have. Uh, and, and maybe uh, that will lead to a resolution of the political crisis, etc. But when you look at the long travail of Haitian history, it's a big question mark. Um, Mark, before you jump in, um, Ambassador Adams has to run off to a very important meeting. Uh, we thought we would lose him about an hour ago. He's managed to hang in here. And could you just express your appreciation for all the work he's doing and his answers? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and now, Mark, will give you the last word okay. on, on responding to these two questions. Because uh, I think that, that, uh, that Robert just gave you the, the real answer, which is that Haiti has to come to a point where the past cannot be prologue to the future. 
and that the elite in Haiti have to recognize that they are on this island, that they are neighbors of the people who are in Cité Soleil, and they have to act that way. And all I want to do is help them. So I'd like to see enforcement of the law for everyone. I'd like to see them pay their taxes, customs taxes first, equal to what they're supposed to pay. And I'd like to see that when they have to go to court, that they, in fact, have to go to court, and they simply can't pay their way out of it. And one of the first examples that goes back to, we really haven't mentioned this, is I would like to see Duvalier <coughs> go to court, have the victims be in court to place the charges against him for what the repression that occurred and the human rights abuses that occurred and the torture that occurred when he was president. Uh, and then I'll feel much better. Okay, well, on that uh, hopeful scenario, uh, I'd like to mention before we break and thank our, our speakers, the last two here, that um, this may in fact be the last Haiti Working Group meeting that will occur in this particular space. As some of you may know, um, and if you don't, I want to tell you that the United States Institute of Peace will be moving uh, during the month of March to its new uh, headquarters, new building, the one that's down there um, right off of Constitution Avenue as you take the bridge into Virginia. It has the roof that I'm told from the air looks like the wings of a dove. And uh, we will be holding future meetings um, at that site. And we hope that we will see you there um, uh, when you get notice of the next meeting. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank not just for this meeting, but for all the work she's done for all the meetings that we've had, uh, Liz Panarelli. Liz, would you stand up, please? Liz, Liz does a tremendous job, and uh, it could have snowed 12 inches, and she'd have been here this morning. <laughs> and could we thank our speakers, uh, Mark Schneider and Robert Fatton. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>